You guys can have a seat. Good evening, church. I am really excited to get to preach tonight. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. We are in the run-up to Easter doing a series on uh, resurrection letters, on seg segments from letters in the New Testament about the resurrection of Jesus and the impact that it has on our lives. Tonight, we're actually going to be talking about the resurrection in the context of suffering and afflictions. I know that seems like more of a Good Friday sermon, but I'm preaching it today. If you want, it'll be up on YouTube. You can listen to it again on Friday. Uh, I won't. I hate the sound of my own voice. I feel sorry for all of you every time I hear myself record it. But we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, like I said. And in this letter, the Apostle Paul is addressing some criticism that he has received from the church at Corinth. They were reluctant to accept his authority as an apostle because they did not think that he cut an impressive enough figure. They thought that he was not impressive enough. In fact, there were other people who came and were more impressive. And they thought, well, why shouldn't we listen to these people? Why should we listen to the apostle Paul and men like him? Uh, there is some implications in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul was not a dynamic public speaker. Uh, that may have been the problem. Um, they definitely, though, took objection to the fact that he seemed to face suffering and affliction everywhere he went. He would show up in town and they would chase him out with rocks and sticks and stuff. He would travel on a boat and that boat would have a shipwreck. He really sometimes seemed to be quite miserable. And so this church questioned how would or why would God proclaim his message through someone so weak, someone so often humiliated, through such a humble vessel, right? How could Paul really be an apostle, really be a messenger from God if he had to suffer so much? Because I think that we tend to expect important things to come in impressive packaging, right? You know, on Christmas, I'd like to go to the largest present and open that first. Uh, it changed as I got older because iPhones are pretty small. Uh, but really, we, we look for the biggest, the most impressive packaging. Like yesterday in our egg hunt uh, at our spring festival, we had a lot of regular eggs that were hidden out there, but there were, there were a few golden eggs that were a little more special. They came with a cash prize. The prize was $1, but that's still technically cash. Right? I don't go to the grocery store and buy the cookies from the beat-up box or the tin can that's dented. I want impressive packaging for the things that I purchase. But that's not how the kingdom of God works. Right? What we're going to read tonight and what Paul is talking about in a lot of this letter of 2 Corinthians is that the messengers of the gospel are often weak, often lowly, often humble or humiliated, but the message is powerful and life transforming. See, the, the weakness of the messenger, in fact, shows that the power comes from God. So as we, as we talk about some of this suffering and affliction tonight, I, I want to note first that I know this isn't just a theoretical discussion for a lot of us, right? That we're not just talking about the theory of what it looks like to suffer as a believer that many of us in this room are suffering right now. Or if not right now, we have suffered recently or will suffer soon, right? This is something that defines all of our lives. And, and so my prayer for tonight is that this would be a comfort and an encouragement for those of us who are following Jesus. So let's read 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 18. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, 
so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised, Jesus, the Lord, who, who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, as we come before you tonight, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word. I pray that your spirit would be at work in our minds and our lives so that we could understand the truth that you would have for us and that it wouldn't stay as just head knowledge but would transform the way we love you, the way we love our neighbors. Lord, I thank you for the gift of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, as we dive in, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the surpassing power that we have in Jesus. We're going to talk about the hope that we have in the resurrection and the eternal weight of glory being prepared for us one day. So let's look first at verses 7 to 12, the surpassing power. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us but life in you. Those are verses 7 to 12, the beginning of this passage of Scripture. And in it, we see Paul, the, Paul and Timothy, those, the uh, signatories of this letter, the we in these sentences, writing to the church at Corinth and describing their experience and how they have experienced both the death of Jesus and the life. And in fact, their death has served to result in life for others. He uses this description of treasure in a jar of clay. Now, we might not immediately connect with that imagery because we probably think that a jar of clay would be something fancy, right? Most of us don't have too many jars of clay. We might have jars of clay CDs, but we don't have too many <laughs> jars of clay some people got it. Yeah, I promise that's the only one of those I'm going to make tonight. Um, a, you know, a, often we think of like vases as, as like fancy, but in this time period, a jar of clay was the most common container possible. This is like Tupperware from the Chinese restaurant, right? This is not fancy. And so Paul uses this imagery of treasure in a jar of clay and something common, something that you would not value, definitely not something you would store your valuables in. It's this picture of something incredibly valuable, treasure, being in stored in something so, so ordinary. It would be like putting your expensive jewelry in Tupperware. And in this metaphor, the jar is himself and Timothy, the messengers of God, the ministers who are traveling from place to place proclaiming the gospel. He was calling himself a jar of clay, something ordinary, something fragile, something breakable. But the treasure he was referring to was his gospel ministry, the good news of Jesus he was proclaiming from city to city in different churches. And here what he's saying is that the reason 
that he has suffered such afflictions, the reason that he has been so ill-treated, the reason why he has faced so much is so that the power of God would be made more clear, would be demonstrated to his church. See, Paul's suffering was an embarrassment for some believers. They looked at how he was treated. They looked at what he had suffered and thought, couldn't God do better? Right? Isn't this a bad look for him to let his messenger be treated like this? But the weakness of Paul proves that God is the one who is building his church. You see, when we succeed despite our weakness, when God does something great with ordinary people, it shows that he is the one who gets the credit and the glory and the honor. Paul writes about this later in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians as he is addressing a weakness that he had in his flesh. He writes this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. One of the things that Pastor Mark says a lot is that we want to be a part of something that can only be explained by the power of God. Right? It was when we moved up here to plant this church, that's one of, that is probably our greatest goal, right? Is that when people look at what happened here, they wouldn't say, oh, those people are so wonderful, it's no wonder they planted such a church. Those people are so wonderful, it's no wonder they had such an impact on their community. We want people to look at our church and say, those guys? Those are the people that God used to do this great thing? We want it to be clear from our weakness and God's power that it was him who did it and not us. See, if God only chose the handsome or the powerful or the successful, then the credit for building his church would go to them. But instead, he has chosen the humble, the poor in spirit, the weak and the broken to showcase his surpassing power. I saw this video on YouTube this week of an artist who decided to recreate uh, this famous painting, Starry Night, by Vincent van Gogh. And they, instead of using, like, brushes or, like, actual tools, just used their fingers. Right? And, and, and I thought that's such a good analogy for what God is doing with the church. He's not using the best tools to accomplish his masterpiece. He's using us. <laughs> it's like a master painter painting with their fingers. And, and when the painting still looks good, that doesn't make you think the tools were incredible. That makes you think that the painter was. So when God plants his church, builds his church, does his, accomplishes his mission with people like us, that shows how powerful, how glorious he really is. And that's why Paul can speak so openly about his weakness. He says that he's carrying the death of Jesus. He says he's afflicted in every way, crushed, or, or afflicted in every way, not crushed, but perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested. So what does it mean to carry in the body the death of Jesus? So I think here Paul is referencing his suffering, his afflictions, the persecution and opposition that he faced. Uh, in chapter 11, he writes this extensive list of afflictions. I'm just going to read it to you and you can tell me if it sounds like a fun time. This is 2 Corinthians 11, 22, 24 to 29. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, though through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure." And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me, on, on, on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? See, Paul here is describing his 
suffering, what he faced as an apostle. That's what he means by carrying the death of Jesus. It's all these different things. For a second there, it almost sounded like Dr. Seuss, right? Danger in the fields, danger in the houses. He experienced all of this suffering. And what Paul is talking about here is a unique type of suffering that we experience as Christians. See, when you become a believer, you're choosing a path, a path both of joy and suffering. Jesus tells us to count the cost before we follow him. And then he calls us to pick up our cross, to follow him, to come and to die to ourselves. He says that the world will hate you as it has hated him. If, it, if the world hated Jesus to the point of crucifying him, it's probably going to have a problem with you if you follow his path. And we have enemies both natural and supernatural, right? The world rejects Jesus. It rejects his followers. And the devil and his angels are working against the mission of God and trying to trip up and trap the people of God. See, this is in addition to the ordinary suffering that we all experience in life. There is active opposition and persecution that those who follow Jesus should expect to experience. So don't expect your life to get easier when you follow Jesus. You absolutely can expect it to get better, but it might not get easier. So Paul is connecting this suffering that he faced in, in his following after Jesus to the death of Jesus on the cross. That's what he means when he says, I carry the death of Jesus in my body. You see, Jesus suffered and died a humiliating death on the cross. He was beaten and mocked. He was publicly executed, surrounded by criminals. That's what we remember on Good Friday, the day that Jesus suffered death on the cross. And the essential thing to know about his death is that he did not die for his own crimes. He died for us. Right? We are by nature sinners separated from God, deserving of wrath destined for destruction and eternity apart from him. The punishment that we deserve for our sin is death. But on that cross on Good Friday, Jesus died for us. He paid the punishment that we, he paid the price that we owed. He took on the punishment we couldn't bear so that if we place our faith in him, we can have life with God. That's what the death of Jesus is. And that is what Paul carried in his body. That's actually what he participates in when he suffered for Jesus. See, he considered his suffering participation in the death of Christ because Jesus' death was once and for all. It was the objective accomplishment of the salvation of God for the people of God. But there still is work to be done. There still is suffering to do to see the mission of God complete. See, Paul suffered so the church would continue to grow. He suffered in taking that message of salvation to the lost and telling those who don't know about Jesus the good news of Jesus. That's why he got shipwrecked so many times. He was taking boats to places where people hadn't heard the gospel. He suffered so the church would grow. And then once they received the gospel, he continued suffering, laboring to help them love the Lord better. That's why in Colossians 1, he uses this language of filling up what is lacking in Christ's suffering. He writes this in Colossians 1, 24 to 26. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake and in my flesh. I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. That's kind of a surprising phrase to hear someone filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I, I wouldn't expect to hear anyone say that something is lacking in Christ's afflictions, but what Paul is saying here is that Christ suffered and died to save us from sin. And now if we join in his mission and suffer for his sake, we are completing God's plan by sharing the gospel with those who don't know it. There's a missional purpose to our suffering when we suffer with Christ. So this is what 
Paul means when he says carrying the death of Christ in his body. But he says more than that, that they carry the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in the flesh. In verse 11, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. See, the life of Jesus was made visible through their suffering for the sake of the gospel. People could see Jesus' life through Paul's suffering for the gospel. Because there's nothing that is more Christ-like than suffering so that someone else can find joy in life in Christ. Right? There's nothing more like Jesus than suffering so that other people can know God better. And while Paul was afflicted, God's resurrecting power was made known to his growing church as the gospel spread and lives were transformed. See, because Paul was weak and humiliated and broken, it became obvious to everyone around him that the transformative power seen in him was not of him, but it was of God. He was a jar of clay filled with this surpassing power, this treasure that can only be explained by the living God. And this passage is a comfort for us who are suffering in Christ's mission because I think it provides a, a glimpse of the purpose that God has for our suffering, a bit of the reason why we have to go through what we have to go through. See, God uses the afflictions and the suffering we face in his mission to demonstrate his surpassing power to a watching world. He uses those things that we go through to demonstrate his power. This doesn't mean that our suffering isn't bad, but, but often when you're suffering for a purpose, that makes it easier, right? If you know why you're going through something, that can make it easier to persevere in. That's what Paul is saying, that it was so that Christ's power would be manifested to his church. That was why he suffered. And because of this surpassing power, we also have hope in affliction. This is my second point, verses 13 to 14. Let's read those again. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. So we see in this passage that Paul has confidence in the salvation of the Lord, that he has confidence in the resurrection and what that means for him. He quotes in this passage Psalm 116. It's a really subtle thing there that you might miss if you're reading quickly. He says, I believed and so I spoke. Earlier, Ben read Psalm 116 and that was a line from it. We're going to look at it more in just a second. But he, he says, Paul says, that he's speaking with the same spirit of faith as the author of Psalm 116. So he's speaking in the same vein about, the, about a similar topic as this other author of Scripture. Psalm 116 is this beautiful psalm celebrating the salvation of God because he has delivered the psalmist from his afflictions, because he has saved him from some unspecified suffering, some unspecified struggle. And, and Paul's not just quoting these words. He's trying to not just quote the specific words, but invoking the entire spirit of the psalm. So let's look at Psalm 116, verses 5 to 14. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefit to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In these verses here, we see a few things. One, we see a celebration of the character of God. He says that gracious is the Lord, righteous our God is merciful. That he preserves the simple, the humble. 
We see a celebration of the salvation of the Lord, that the Lord has dealt bountifully with the psalmist, that he has delivered his soul from death. And we see an expression of thanksgiving. This question, what shall I render to the Lord? What can I give God for the good gift he has given me in this promise to pay his vows in the presence of his people? So when Paul says, I believed and so I spoke, he is quoting this psalm, this idea that we can trust in the goodness of God even in affliction. He's speaking with the same spirit as the psalmist and not just because of these smaller times he's been saved from all these afflictions, but he's speaking with the spirit because of his hope in the resurrection of Jesus, right? Because he's, he knows, like it says in, four, in verse 14, that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us into his presence. See, Paul, even though he's facing afflictions, can join with the psalmist in celebrating God's salvation. He knows that because of his faith, he has been united into Christ's death to sin and raised into newness of life. Often when we talk about our salvation, we talk about something that happened to us in the past, that we got saved when we were such and such an age. But, but when we look at it in scripture, we see it's not just this past completed thing that our salvation is also a present ongoing reality. We are being saved from our sin and it's a future promise that there will come a day when we will be resurrected fully like Jesus, never to die again, free from sin and death and pain and suffering. That's what Paul is saying by quoting this psalm that even though he is in affliction, he knows that one day it will end and he will be resurrected like Christ. See, Paul interprets his experiences through the lens of the cross, and his afflictions become a reminder of the life that he will share with Christ in heaven. He looks at his life in the way that, he looks at his life through this lens of Christ's death and resurrection and realizes my suffering is like Christ's death, therefore my life will be his. It will be like his. Like the psalmist, he believes that the Lord preserves the simple. So he can speak, gracious is the Lord, righteous, our God is merciful. And so we, like Paul, can hope in the resurrection. Right? The resurrection proves that any suffering we're facing is not permanent. Anything that you are going through, any struggle or trial, if you are a child of God, if you've placed your faith in him, it will pass. I think one of the key causes of hopelessness is the belief that your suffering will never end. Right? When you wake up and you think that this is bad and it's just going to be bad forever, that there's no hope to ever see this change. But the resurrection means that there is no trial or struggle or situation that will last forever. The life of Jesus will have the final say. You will share in his resurrection. Right? This means for us that sickness, depression, grief, pain, anxiety, all of these things will not have the final say in our lives. If we are in Christ, we will share in his resurrection. That's what we see in John 11 when after the death of Lazarus, Jesus goes to comfort his sisters Mary and Martha. Martha asks him, Martha says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died kind of questioning why he would allow something like this to happen. And Jesus responds to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. See, if you are in Christ and your afflictions will not have the final word, you will share in his resurrection. So we can join Paul in speaking about the goodness of God, even in our afflictions. My last point in this sermon is to reflect on the eternal weight of glory we see talked about in verses 15 to 18. Let's read those again. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 
For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So Paul recognizes the reason for his suffering as is so that more people could experience the grace of God. All right, he, he says, for your sake, it is, for, it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving. I'm suffering so that people can understand the goodness of God, experience his transforming grace. He's giving a missional purpose for his suffering, suffering for the sake of missions. You see, God could have chosen any method he wanted to spread his kingdom. He could have chosen to have powerful leaders and armies of angels announce this gospel message. But instead, he has chosen to advance his kingdom through faithfully proclaiming his message, through people faithfully proclaiming his message in the face of adversity and affliction. He's chosen to use humble and broken people to be his messengers, his representatives, his apostles. Hebrews talks about how Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who started it, the one who did it best. And he suffered on the cross. He was rejected and despised, beaten and crucified. And we're invited to take up our own cross to follow him. That's the path that God has chosen. He sent us out as more than conquerors, carrying the death of Christ in our bodies, so that the life of Christ can be manifested before a watching world. See, God has chosen death and humiliation as his method for bringing about redemption. That's what we see on the cross. That's what we see in Paul's life. And it's what the church has seen throughout all of history. There's one early church father who made this phrase kind of famous, that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Right, that the church has grown from those who have given their life bearing witness to the goodness of Jesus. God uses our suffering in his mission to prepare a harvest of men and women with whom we'll get to worship forever. That's why we can see in Psalm 116, God says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I think what's beautiful about this is that as we read about this eternal weight of glory being prepared for us, a part of that glory, a part of that joy is the growth of the church that we get to participate in. See, in heaven, we'll get to celebrate for eternity with some of the men and women who we share the gospel with. Have you ever thought about that? How if you share the gospel with someone and they give their lives to Christ, then you'll get to celebrate with them not just now but for all eternity? How sweet will it be to see people in heaven who are there because you took a step of faith and shared the good news? Two weekends ago, I was at a wedding for a friend of mine I've had since kindergarten. Uh, and, And at the rehearsal dinner, um, one of our mutual friends got up and gave a toast to honor our, our buddy. And, and as he, he told some funny stories and he gave him a hard time a little bit, you know, like you're supposed to. Uh, but then he shared at the end something I hadn't heard before, that it was my friend who had led him to Christ. And it was just this beautiful moment that really to me was a preview of what heaven's going to be like. Seeing this bond that they had, because as much as they shared as friends before, The one led the other to Christ. They shared so much more as brothers after. And they had such life that they had in common because one took that step of faith to tell him the gospel. So as we enter into the mission and we suffer for the gospel, we actually increase our own joy by sharing the gospel with others. As we're suffering for God's mission, we are preparing for ourselves greater joy in heaven because there'll be more people to celebrate. See, Paul recognized that the greatness of what is in store for him, that that because of the greatness of what is in store for him, he can call his suffering light and momentary affliction. I've suffered in my life. I don't think I've ever called it light and momentary affliction. But Paul could call it that because he saw the greatness of what was ahead. Verse 17 and 18. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 
For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. See, Paul's hope was in the eternal, unseen realities that are his, that are ours in salvation. And that helped him to endure the suffering he was facing. He understands the life that awaits him in heaven because of the resurrection. And because he understands it, he can endure suffering. He knows that one day, he knew that one day there would be no more pain or suffering or sorrows or tears. That death would not have dominion over him because of Christ's resurrection. And he anticipates the joy that he will share with the church for eternity. Paul writes all over the New Testament about his love for the church. And he looks forward to the joy that they will share. But above all, we know about Paul that he recognized that the joy that comes from knowing God is greater than anything else. Of all the treasures in heaven, knowing God will be the sweetest. In Philippians 3, he writes about how everything he had before Christ he considers rubbish compared to the surpassing worth of knowing God. He's the greatest treasure in heaven. See, these things that await us in heaven are so good that if we were to compare our present realities to them, whatever suffering you're going through is light and momentary affliction. I think of it kind of like waiting in line for a roller coaster. Like I really like a roller coaster, and sometimes if it's a good ride, not if it's a bad one, you'll have to wait like an hour to get up there. And the whole time I'm waiting, I'm just irritated. <laughs> It's terrible. I can't think of anything worse than just standing in line. It's probably hot and the people around me probably don't smell good. Um, but once you get up there and you actually experience it, that waiting seems to have been nothing. Light and momentary. I think that's, what's gonna, that's what it's going to feel like when we actually understand what's in store for us in heaven. That our suffering here will have been light and momentary. Because it doesn't always feel light now. One of the beautiful things about the Christian faith is that it, it doesn't deny the realities of suffering. It doesn't pretend like there aren't problems in our lives, that there isn't real loss or grief. In fact, we worship a Lord who was crucified, who suffered and died, that he was tempted and tried in every way so that he could sympathize with our sufferings. You're not alone in your affliction. But there is something so much greater being prepared for us now that we won't even consider comparing what we, have, what we will have to what we're going through now. So what? What's the point of this message? How do we, as Christians, think about our sufferings and afflictions? Well, I think there are a few things that we should know and then really one thing we should do. So let's talk about first the stuff you should know. One, I think you need to know that you're not alone. That if you're a believer and you're suffering, you are participating in Christ's suffering. You are carrying the death of Christ in your body, which means that Jesus has already suffered. That he knows exactly what it's like to suffer, and he is with you in that. You are not isolated, alone. We also need to know that our suffering is not permanent. That the resurrection is this guarantee of a new life promised to us. That if we have faith in God, one day our suffering will end. And we need to know that our suffering is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. So that's what we need to know. But there's also, I think, something we're called to do. I think we're called to join in the mission of God. We're called to pray, to give, and to go for his kingdom. Right? We're called to follow the path of Jesus and suffer so that others can find life. The best way to do this is in cooperation with your local church. It's very hard to live for Christ alone, but if you have a church family that can come around you, that can give you avenues to plug in, you can find places to serve so that others can find life. Now, this will lead to suffering, but it will also lead to joy. Tonight, I've been talking a lot about what is true for us who are in Christ. And if you're not a believer, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, this is not true for you, but it can be. You can have life. 
If you have not placed your faith in him, then you're not participating in his suffering and you won't share in his life one day. But if, if you place your faith in him, if you repent of your sin and you give your life to Jesus, you can have life both now and forever. See, God has chosen common vessels, jars of clay, to be his messengers so that the world might see the surpassing power of his gospel and come to faith. Let's join in the work.